now you're up on the stream. So, um, let's see. We can give you an intro. Uh, Phil, if you haven't, if you're not already familiar with Phil, um, Phil is a member of the Bug Crowd Ambassador team. Um, he's been a really great advocate for Bug Crowd, but also for the InfoSec and hacker community. He's done a lot to give back to his local community um, where he lives. And we are really excited to have him here today to talk about um, penetration testing and then um, hopefully give people some good tips and tricks and techniques and, and words of wisdom on how to get into the penetration testing space so that you can do it um, on the side or, or even something like the um, bug crowd NGBT testing, which is basically a, a penetration test that we uh, work with our, our crowd with. So. Yeah, uh, Philip, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm excited for your talk. Take it away. Oh, thanks, Sam. Thanks, oh. for, thanks for the introduction. This is an honor. This has been a goal of mine since Level Up 1 to eventually be able to present here, and I've learned a lot of good information along the way. This is how I found out about the Ambassador Program last year through, through uh, Level Up 2. And so this has been one of my goals, so it's awesome to be doing this today. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. So um, to get started, Sam kind of gave you a little overview of but a little more detail on my background. I'm a pen tester is my day job. I'm an adjunct uh, instructor at Richland College. I teach ethical hacking web application pen testing. This past January made a year that I've been teaching and for, for a long time I've uh, Kind of mentored people and helped people that were interested in becoming pen testers or other areas of security. So, so uh, sharing with people and teaching was uh, something that was a passion of mine, and teaching was just a further way to enhance that, to do it on a broader scale. And then becoming an ambassador, this played into uh, this meetup that I started here locally in the Dallas area called the Pwn School Project. It's a monthly meetup that's educational, teaching on uh, penetration testing techniques and ethical hacking. And there's a lot of other, we're lucky in here in Dallas to have like Dallas Hackers Association and a local DEF CON group that uh, we have so much here locally that we're lucky. But one of the things the other ones, the other groups were doing, they'd do presentations on certain techniques, but it didn't really go into detail. So people that were new, you know, was they'd have to go home and do a lot of studying to try to figure out what was being said. So I saw the need for my students completing my, completing my class to continue on in their education. And then people locally that just maybe couldn't afford the training as a way to offer training to them. So that's how the Pwn School Project was started. And being an ambassador just played into that because uh, being an ambassador, you give back to the community, you uh, teach others. And one of the goals that I have is try to teach people to be researchers. So this played in my, to the grand scheme of things that uh, I was doing. So this played in well. I've been in InfoSec and IT for over 21 years. Uh, 15 plus of it's been security alone. I started out as a system administrator. Uh, spent eight years doing network security and application security. Application security is where I got interested in pen testing. So the, over the past seven years, that's what I've been doing is pen testing. I finally found the job that I really enjoy. A lot of their positions, even in security and IT, after a while, you kind of got bored and it wasn't as interesting, but pen testing has remained uh, just as interesting as it was when I started. And kind of to give you a little more about my background, the scenic route, I guess you could say, my nonlinear path to InfoSec is before I ever got into IT, I, I started out as a pro wrestler. Um, wasn't a really good lifestyle after getting married. I needed something where I didn't travel as much stable income. So I went to school to be a CAD draftsman. And then from being a CAD draftsman, I learned about sysadmin work, which was a lot more interesting to me. I found out through going to CAD school that I had more of a niche for, for technology. So that led me to be a sysadmin, then an infosec, and then eventually become a pen tester. And during my pro wrestling career, actually one time I did wrestle a bear. So here's a couple pictures up from my old pro wrestling days. Back then, when I was getting started, I would, never, would have never known that I'd be using my brain for a living because I was always into powerlifting and, you know, did the wrestling thing and thought whatever I would do would be uh, just physically based. But after getting a little education, I learned that, that uh, technology was a lot more fun. 
And so uh, we're going to discuss today, we're going to describe pen testing, the types of pen tests, specialization, skills for other roles, needs to be a pen tester, uh, the things you need to, to learn to be a pen tester, learning resources, how to get experience and certifications that are helpful in being a penetration tester. And this is one of the slides I share with my students each semester. And I want to share this message to anyone that, that may be new to pen testing, ethical hacking, or, or security research. Uh, I got this quote from, from one of the Spider-Man movies when Uncle Ben was telling uh, Peter that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So you want to remember this. Whenever, anytime you're hacking, make sure you got permission. Without permission, it's illegal. And better off, you want written, written permission, proof that you have the permission to do that. And either you do, you go through some company to do pen testing, or you go through like bug crowd and doing bug bounties. That way you've got permission to do it. You know, you can run into some problems when you get someone that says, hey, can you test this system? It's mine. And uh, it could be someone else's system or someone's trying to get you to illegally breach a system. So you definitely want to be careful with this. Uh, with a felony on your record, it would make it really hard to get, get jobs as a pen tester or in security at all. So keep that in mind. And what is pen testing? So pen testing is assessing security from the adversarial perspective, exploiting vulnerabilities, gain access to systems and sensitive data, basically hacking. That's why more commonly you hear the term for a pen tester is ethical hacking. This is more a better way to describe penetration testing can be kind of a confusing term. So anytime I tell people that aren't in the industry what I do for a living, I tell them I'm an ethical hacker. It makes, it makes a lot more sense to them than, than penetration tester. Why pen testing? Well, pen testing gives you a better understanding of the, security, the risk severity of uh, security risks. If you exploitable vulnerabilities are higher risk and higher priority for mediation than in uh, justification for budgeting. So low level finding may not be that high risk. So this kind of, if it's exploitable, then it's a higher risk. And this is a good way to show that these uh, items are exploitable, ex exploitable and it's easier to get budget to remediate items when you can prove that they can actually be exploited. Because sometimes there's some low level or informational findings that you may not be able to exploit. They're not that risky, but if you can prove that they're exploitable, that's a good way to uh, get the budget to, uh, to remediate those. And plus just from, from testing this way, testing security, you're able to find things you wouldn't find with just a typical vulnerability scan. You're able to dig further past that vulnerability and see what else can be done. What other vulnerabilities lie in that system behind the, the firewall, the antivirus and other endpoint protection on it? And uh, regulatory compliance. This is a big thing that drives a lot of pen tests at our company. A lot of our tests are based on PCI. So this is where we do most of our work for PCI. Plus another thing about pen testing, it's a fun job with a lot of great opportunities. Used to in the past, the, the only job you really seen out there were contractors or consultants. Most companies didn't have their own uh, internal pen testers, but that's kind of changing with the times. People are starting to add their own internal pen testers because it can be expensive in some cases to use only, only consultants or contractors. And a lot of companies like our company, there's, there's numerous companies that have big penetration testing teams and companies are adding pen test teams as time goes by. Pen testing jobs are, are, are you know, most commonly some of these, when you're looking for a job, you'll see some of the titles, this is penetration testers or pen testers, but more commonly you'll see something like security consultant, analyst, or engineers. You really have to dig into the job descriptions to find out if it's you know an actual pen testing job sometimes, because typically you'll see like uh, analyst or engineer. Some other words synonymous with pen testing is ethical hacking, offensive security, adversarial security, and these a lot of times will fall under groups known as threat and vulnerability management. So when you're looking for a job, just kind of keep, you know, like the threat and vulnerability management, several companies I work for, that was the title of our, our pen test team. And pen testing skills that are valuable in other areas, SOC analysts, the understanding malicious traffic can help you as a SOC analyst. Digital forensics and incident response. If you're responding to an incident, if you understand the attack vectors, then you're going to be able to, it's gonna make your life easier. You're gonna, it's gonna give you an edge figuring out how, how things were, how these breaches occurred. Network security analysts and engineers, uh, this is valuable to them. Purple teams where you're doing both defensive and offensive. Application security, it's really good in that area as well. 
So you can do some of your testing. You may not necessarily be doing the pen test, but be able to perform some kind of uh, some kind of assessment, security assessment of the software is kind of is, is good to have. And security researchers, as we know as, uh, as bug hunters, this is a good area to have uh, pen testing skills. A lot of good bug hunters come from pen testing backgrounds. For instance, Jason Haddix, uh, you know, he comes from a pen testing background. So you may be a bug hunter, but it doesn't hurt to expand past the application layer to understand the network layer and some of the other uh, areas that can be exploited. And types of pen test targets. Uh, so these are the items that you would normally test. And some of the most common ones, common ones are listed here first. Network, your internal, external, and wireless networks, uh, application, web app, thick client, mobile, and cloud. And then your hardware hacking, network, hardware, routers, and switches, and even down to some of the more newer technologies like IoT and medical devices. You know, with medical devices, you want to make sure that these are secure, uh, at least the devices are secure, at least on a secure network to prevent someone from having access to pacemakers or insulin pumps. I've done uh, wireless pen tests for hospitals before, and it's interesting to see all the wireless, the devices connected wirelessly to their, their Wi-Fi network. In transportation, this is where your car hacking comes in handy. All, all types of uh, vehicles, you know, buses, planes, cars, with the autonomous, autonomous self-driving vehicles coming out, this is you know, becoming a lot more serious area that they need to make sure that these, that these uh, cars or, or, or buses, et cetera, whatever vehicle is secure. So this is a popular area. I even saw that there is a, a college in Texas that were proposing a vehicle pen testing course or degree, part of their security program. So this is starting to get to be well more uh, visible area that people are realizing the need for security people, uh, social engineering. So you're actually trying to hack the human element. Sometimes your endpoint protections, your firewalls, all this other security may prevent you from actually breaching the network. But if you can get someone to click on a file or let you in a door, then there's possibilities to hack into those ways. So that's one of the targets that uh, pen testers or red teamers will try to uh, hack. Buildings, your physical security, this is very important. You can have the most sophisticated security, everything can be locked down great, but if someone's able to get in the door and get physical access, all bets are off. So this is one of the areas is good and it's usually typically done within a uh, social engineering engagement. Types of pen test knowledge. This is the knowledge of your target you're testing. So as a pen tester, uh, the first one we're gonna look at is black box. This means like limited, to maybe IP addresses at the most, and it's more of an attacker approach. And this requires a little more time than like the white box. Your white box, also known as crystal box, is detailed system info, including accounts for apps, testing, documentation, this could be Visio diagrams, more information. Uh, a lot of pen testers think that this is not, this is kind of cheating a white box pen test, but when you have a little, little time to test, then you want to be able to test all the controls. And a lot of this requires being able to access the application as a user and even administrator. Uh, when I test applications, I like to have multi-levels. I like to have administrator and other uh, roles that may be of users that are on that system. So that way you can make sure that they can't get the information that they shouldn't get to. Even administrators, there's some information that they shouldn't see. They shouldn't see full unmasked account numbers and social security numbers. And you also want to test to see if you can escalate privileges if a low level user can get to admin and so forth, access information they shouldn't. And then the next level is gray box. This is kind of a little more common what you see. Partial knowledge of target. This is kind of a cross between black box and white box testing. Uh, you'll get easily in this, you get more, you know, the IPs, you know, URLs and that stuff and not necessarily accounts. A little more information than black box, but not the full extent of white box. But all these different types of testing are important. And a lot of these are dictated by uh, the amount of time you have for the pen test. If you've got a week on an application, you're gonna have to be a lot better off doing a white box test. And compared that to a malicious actor, malicious actors have all the time in the world. So that's one of the, the uh, things that a pen tester runs into, the limitations of time. And the types of tests, testing depth, these are gonna kind of give you the different levels of what's required in a test. 
and some of these as standalone functions in a threat and vulnerability management program. First, we'll look at your, your vulnerability scans. This is your Nessus, your Nexpos, your Qualys. You're scanning against these items and then for application web inspect or um, app scan, uh, NetSpark or some of these other types of vulnerability scanners. You're just looking for vulnerabilities with this. So this is not giving you the level of depth as a pen test, but this is just scanning for vulnerabilities, looking for your low hanging fruit. And this could be dedicated groups in a company that do reoccurring scanning. And your next level is your vulnerability assessments. A lot of times as a pen tester, you may start out doing vulnerability assessments. And a vulnerability assessment is basically the vulnerability scan plus validation. You're validating the findings. You're making sure there's no false positives. There's some, it's a little, this kind of simplifies it. There's more things to it. When you're validating those vulnerabilities, you can use other tools outside of the vulnerability scanner, but this is the next level in the process. And then from the vulnerability assessment comes a pen test. These are taking these other two areas, plus you're adding exploitation. So you're, the, the vulnerabilities that you were able to validate, now you're gonna to try to see if you're going to exploit them. And exploitation in common terms, hacking. So you're gonna to try to see if you can hack into those systems through those exploits. And then you have red teaming and adversarial tests. Uh, people have been in, most people have been in the industry for a while will uh, have a different view of red team. A lot of times it's looked at generically as the red team is offensive, blue team is defensive, but in the field, Red teaming is more of adversarial simulation. So this is a step above pen testing. And one of the best uh, definitions I heard of that is Wirefall from Dallas Hackers referred to this as testing the blue team. You're testing the controls, you're testing the staff, you're seeing how they react. Most times in red, team, red teaming or adversarial simulations, they don't let the security people know this is going on. So that way they can test their reactions, make sure the, the things they have in place to protect the network are working properly and that the people that are watching these items and monitoring the network are seeing these and blocking or be able to at least identify these attacks. And this is the part most people want to hear. I, I like to cover up front about pen testing so you can understand these other items, why you need to know that. So this is really usually what people like about this talk or that when I give talks about uh, becoming a pen tester. And this talk, I didn't mention the first, is kind of an evolution of the talk I do the first day of class for my students. My first day of the ethical hacking class, telling them about you know pen testing and what's required to become a pen tester. And so uh, technological knowledge, you have to understand technology. You have to understand something before you can protect it or before you can hack into it. So you need to understand networking, operating systems, especially Windows and Linux, and security. So you need to understand security, understand firewalls, how firewall rules work, uh, file systems, how your file permissions work, and then also application, understanding some application security. If you're just a generalist or, or pen tester that's not specializing in application security, you still need to understand web applications a little bit, understand a little bit about the uh, uh, application security and how those function. And then hardware, so understanding how servers work and workstations and so forth, understanding computing in general. So these are the things you really need to understand going into this. And to kind of add on to that, uh, when I started my first pen testing job, my manager at the company that I worked at, which was in consulting, he always encouraged us to build something. He wasn't really pushing us to learn how to hack. He said, you know, if you learn how to build it, then you can learn how to break into it. So the next thing you need to, once you understand those other technologies, to be a pen tester, you need to understand how to hack. And so you can get this through classes, conferences, meetups, and self-study is the route most people take. Even if you get to go to these classes or conferences and stuff, then you still need to do some study on your own. Being a pen tester or in a lot of areas of security alone, it's not not a real easy job to, it's, if you don't go in, you don't, if you're gonna succeed, you don't go in with the, the, the um, mindset that I'm gonna work nine to five and that's it. And, and you don't want that, this mindset of I'm only going to get training when the company's paying for it. If you wanna get ahead, you've gotta study on your own. The people that get ahead, 
you'll take people that have been in the industry a long time that's the nine to fiver that I'm not going to study unless the company sends me for training. They'll get passed up by the new people. So just to stay up with technology, this is something you need to spend some time on your own outside of work studying. And if you're trying to move over from another area, you know, if you're doing, you know, web development somewhere, they may not let you spend the time studying, you know, pen testing. So at any rate, these are the different I, the different areas you can learn that. And as far as the self-study, home labs are very valuable. This is one of the best ways. I learn better hands-on videos, uh, different tutorials, blogs, and articles. Twitter's a real good resource. That's where I get most of my information. And Twitter's how I found out about bug hunters. That's one of the reasons I was drawn to bug crowd was just finding some of these researchers and bug hunters like Jason and some of these other guys that are really top bug hunters. I've learned some interesting web application pen testing stuff for them. So that's who I follow. I get most of my information from Twitter. A lot of people put up tweets. Maybe they've got some tool that's coming out that hasn't been, you know, mentioned in an article yet that hasn't really been fully released to the public. So this is a good way to get in and find out this stuff early on. And so the hacker mindset is something that you need. The hacker mindset is pretty interesting because being a, a pen tester, being a hacker, being, you know, a security researcher, the one area, the one thing about this part of security is it takes creativity. So it's kind of a combination of uh, creativity and analytical thinking. And so this is developed, it's similar, it's similar to developing the mindset of troubleshooting. Because when you first go in somewhere, like my one of my first sysadmin jobs, all I was doing was installs. We were rolling out servers, so there wasn't a lot of troubleshooting. So I had extensive research. And then my next job, we I was in an environment that's very unstable. Systems were overloaded, not configured right, constantly breaking. And I was really overwhelmed, putting in a lot of hours. And I was close to quitting the job, but then I stopped thought. I got all this experience installing, but where I'm really lacking is I'm really lacking experience with troubleshooting, so I stuck it out. So the same thing with hacking, you, you kind of go in and, and like troubleshooting. If you know you're not connecting, make sure the cable's plugged in, make sure that you know, you've know you got your network card configured right. So some of these little details, as you practice hacking, then you kind of, it becomes second nature. So you know if you see a uh, unprotected upload, that maybe you can upload a war file and create a malicious JSP page on, on an Apache uh, Tomcat server. So as you learn these things, you know how to hack one thing that you can build upon that. And this is best developed through repetition and hands-on hacking experience. It's something you would get through labs or uh, bug bounties. And the formula for becoming a pen tester is technology, technology knowledge plus security knowledge plus the hacker mindset. These are the three items needed to, to be a pen tester. And where do you start? So you start off by developing your plan. You want to assess your current skill set. Figure out, look at all the things that you know so far and perform a gap analysis on the skills needed. Look at the things you need to learn. Like we discussed, you need to understand networking. You need to understand uh, operating systems. So you look at these items and find out where your weaknesses are. And that's what you need to focus your, your learning towards. In developing this plan, we're like we were looking for the gaps. Now it's time to fill the gaps. If you have no IT experience, start with the basics: operating systems, hardware, networking. Think you know like A plus certification, progressing towards like network plus. And then if you have IT experience, uh, then you need to learn Linux and security and networking. If you're you're rolling in IT, you may know networking, but these are some common areas that that most people need to look at. And if you have InfoSec experience, fill those gaps. Any of the basics that you're missing with pen testing and ethical hacking, participate in CTFs and bug bounties and your labs. And, it, and this goes for the, the bottom step. Everyone build a lab. Everyone, you know, some of the, the most experienced hackers I know have labs and they've been pen testing for like 20 years. So it's, you can always learn. And when you have a lab, you can always test the proof of concept that you may try to use on a bug bounty or maybe you're doing a, a pen test. So if you have this lab, you can test these exploits because you're not always gonna to run to these exploits in the wild. So if you have a lab, you can build a lab, put in these vulnerable apps and test these, you know, the latest exploits. And get experience. CTFs, there's a lot of online CTFs. 
you can go to conferences or other events like our meetup Dallas Hackers Association. We have a CTF each month. Bug bounties are a great place. And the thing I really like about bug bounty programs, it's an actual production environment. So you're actually getting production experience. When you go in and do an interview with an employer and they ask you how you do, you know, ask you about cross-site scripting or SQL injection, you're able to describe these and tell them how, how you were able to exploit those in a bug bounty. So once you get this experience, this is actual real world, you're doing you know, this in the real world. A CTF is a simulated environment. It's purposely vulnerable, so that may not as be as helpful, but if you're doing like a bug bounty and you find bugs in there, then it's going to uh, go a lot further and get helping you get a pen test job. And pro bono work or volunteer work, do free pen, pen tests for nonprofit organizations or small businesses that can't afford pen tests. So this will actually give you real world experience and people that you can use as a reference when looking for those jobs. And um, we'll mention this probably even more throughout this talk, but labs, personal lab and online labs is a good way to get experience. If you can describe how to use these tools, you know, you can use that information on an interview. And specializations, most people who start out as a generalist and a generalist, you need at least network, wireless and, and web app. Sometimes starting out, like when I was starting out at first, I just did network and web application and moved into wireless. But this is more the generalist role, your typical pen tester uh, no, does wireless network and web app. And then application, you can specialize in application. So you can do web app, mobile app, thick client and cloud. And then hardware, you can specialize, I, specialize in IoT, network hardware, medical devices. You, know, you can work for some company as a researcher testing the different hardware devices. Uh, vehicles, your automobiles, trucks, and multi-passenger vehicles and vans, and even aircraft, those some type of specializations. And you're starting to see more of the vehicle uh, jobs, more of the car hacking jobs out there. And some of these areas that you don't see as much people in, this may be a good way to to f something to focus on if you're just getting started out as well, because since there's not as many people in those areas that maybe there's opportunities there that may not exist in some of the other more populated areas. Although the uh, security field is understaffed, so once you have the right skills and experience, then uh, it's only a matter of time before you get your foot in the door. And then your labs, you know, we talked about labs. So your minimalist lab, this is just putting virtualized hosts using VM, VirtualBox, hypervisor, whatever uh, virtualization that you choose to use on a, a desktop or a laptop. I like a laptop because that way you can carry it with you. If you travel, you go on vacation, you can still spend a little time in your lab. Or if you get bored at home, you've been studying, you need to go somewhere, get out of the house, go to a coffee shop, maybe study for a bit. So that's, that's kind of a nice setup to have there. And then your dedicated lab. So then you have like a machine or some Raspberry Pis or some small devices that you could set up with uh, VMs on there. Let's put vulnerable, vulnerable VMs and then attack from another system. And then as you get more advanced labs, you can get individual computers for servers and routers and switches. So you can break it down. But one of the things, the things about building some of these, the more advanced stuff, you'll get a little more experience learning how to build networks, you know, setting up these applications that are vulnerable. They're, the vulnerable VMs are great, but a w way to take a step above that is to download the, the uh, vulnerable applications and build that out yourself. And then your attack platform, you've got your lab set up. So now you need to be able to, you need something to hack with. So the most common one you're gonna see is Kali Linux. It works, it's a pretty good uh, hacking distribution. It has most of the tools installed by default. If not, it's in the rep repositories for Kali Linux and can be installed fairly easy. And then Ubuntu with the uh, pen tester framework script from Trusted Sec, Security, Trusted Sec. It's a little script that you can run on Ubuntu and it will install all the different pen testing tools if you'd rather run on Ubuntu. And then Parrot OS is another uh, Linux distribution that's got all the, the pen testing hacking tools in, installed. And it's also good to get some experience with Windows. Uh, when Backtrack came out eventually, it was, it was the predecessor to Kali Linux. That's where a lot of people started going that way. But now with all the PowerShell tools and, and be able to operate hacking tools natively in a Windows environment, it's good to have a Windows VM 
or a standalone Windows system that you can hack with. And so you can take like Windows 10 and use FireEye's Commando uh, VM scripts. And the Commando VM scripts is similar to, if we think about it, coming from using the Pentester framework script, it's similar to that. It it's, uh, automates in installing the different pen testing tools on Windows 10. So you have all the PowerShell, even Metasploit, all that installed on there. So this is also a good alternative if you uh, don't have much experience with Windows administration, then you definitely want to look at this because, you know, being able to run PowerShell natively and all these tools is a great option. And whenever I was consulting, uh, I had like a Windows VM on my attack box that I used. So I had like uh, VMware and Windows 10. I usually use like Ubuntu or Mac OS was my, my host OS. And then I re ran VMs with those other tools. And lab targets. So you create your virtual machines. You can get the targets from Vulnhub. There's a lot of great vulnerable VMs on there. Some of them, some of them are from uh, CTFs that's been held at conferences. Two that I recommend getting started out with too, as far as your your uh, virtual, virtual vulnerable hosts, vulnerable VMs is Metasploitable two and Metasploitable three. Those are really good as well as the OWASP WebGoat. You can create your own target VMs, download the software from ExploitDB. So you may not find uh, VMs that have particular exploits on there. So you may, and some of the VMs, since uh, there's licensing for Windows, it's a little more difficult to find some vulnerable Windows VMs. So a lot of cases you should create your own. And so by downloading the software from ExploitDB, you can build your own that way. And recommended reading. So here's the, the books I recommend starting out with. Pen Testing, A Hands-On Introduction to Hacking. That book is by Georgia Weedman. Uh, I used that book for my first three semesters of my ethical hacking class. Later on, we went to the Pen Test Plus to give students an option to be able to, uh, to be able to get a certification, to study for a certification. And then the next book I recommend after you get through the penetration testing book is the the Hacker's Playbook version two and three. I would start with two, and then you can go on and move on to three from there. Version three gets into a lot more red teaming. So if you're, the red teaming thing interests you, then that's a good one to move on to. And the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. And this is the second edition. This is really good for web application pen testing. And I recommend it for anyone as a pen tester, because sometimes if you're, on, you're doing a network pen test, and some, you may not be able to get into anything, but you may find a vulnerable app. So understanding how to do perform some level application pen testing is very important. And then the last book I have listed on here is the Red Team Field Manual. This is a good reference manual. It's got a lot of different syntax for Cisco, uh, Python scripts, Linux and Windows system administration stuff. It's a really small book, easy to easy to carry carry around with you and with a lot of good tips that can be helpful to a pen tester, even anyone in security or uh, blue teaming. And then here's some learning resources that, that are pretty good when getting started out. The top portion, you can see the divide between these two lists. Uh, the top portion are resources that, that cost money, obviously. So SANS Institute has a lot of really good uh, courses related to pen testing and other areas of security. And then this kind of, as this goes down, they kind of get a little less expensive than e-learn security. That's a good place for, uh, for uh, courses, online courses. They have, I've taken their web application pen testing class when I was first getting involved in web app pen testing. I took their mobile uh, security assessment, their mobile pen testing course, which is really good. I've taken that. And there's another site, Virtual Hacking Labs, if you're interested in the OSCP, I would recommend starting with Virtual Hacking Labs before you sign up for the OSCP. Virtual Hacking Labs has like an associated class, a course with it, a course manual, and it shows you how to perform different pen testing steps. And then as you get into the lab, the lab's pretty nice. They're fairly, fairly new systems in there and even like uh, mobile devices. So this is a really good place to start out with. And also each one of the VMs, they'll give you the level of difficulty of the VM. And the ones that are rated easy or beginner will give you some, some uh, pointers on what to do, some hints to hack that system. And as you get to the more difficult ones, 
you get less hits, which they're kind of, they wing you off. So once you get those more experienced systems, you've been working in this lab so long, you really, you know, hopefully working towards you don't need the hints, but it's a really good, really good place to start. And uh, I found out through one of my students, my first semester, someone recommended it, recommended it to him. And I really don't like to recommend things unless I've tried it myself. So I had, I got, you know, like a 90 day subscription to it and uh, played around with it. It's a really good, really good learning resource. And then Pentester Academy, they've recently added some labs. It's amazing the number of labs they have on there now. Anything from web application, pen testing to network, they have CTFs, uh, they've got stuff related to Wireshark, different network sniffing. I mean, it's a really great resource. Uh, then Practical Pen Test Labs, this one is super cheap. I think this one is like $64 for lifetime access. It's got a little short course. It's got some online labs that you access through a VPN. And then these next items below are free resources. And Bug Crowd University, if you're wanting to be a security researcher or if you're wanting to just be a pen tester, there's some very good information on there that covers a lot of the good basics for uh, penetration web app pen testing. And this, this semester, I added this to my, I started a web application pen testing course at the community college where I teach and part of our curriculum is Bug Crowd University. So we cover that. And the SANS pen testing blog, this is a good place for all the cheat sheets for Nmap, uh, Metasploit. So I would sign up for SANS to get their emails so you get more information, but the blog, follow that blog, they have a lot of good how to's and cheat sheets. And then hackingtutorials.org, this is another great site. This one was actually created by the people that created virtual hacking labs. Only this is a free site. They've got tutorials on OpenBoss, which is an open source uh, vulnerability scanner, as well as Nmap tutorials and Metasploit. So there's a lot of really good tutorials on there. And this is free. And then cyberry.it, they've got some, some good resources on there. Actually, the advanced pen testing course on there was created by Georgia Weedman. And I actually was, was using those videos for my class. So that way they'd have some videos to go along with their reading assignments and labs. And then the Web Security Academy, this is Portswigger, the creators of Burp Suite. They've come out with, instead of updating their uh, web application hacker's handbook, they're going to start publishing new con content to their Web Security Academy. And they just recently added more content. This was part of uh, the curriculum for my students this semester. Part of their labs were to go on, on onto this uh, website and uh, go through the, the different tutorials on there. They give you really good expl explanations of the vulnerabilities and how to exploit them. And then they have labs that you can actually try out the exploits for those vulnerabilities. And of course, they're covering the, you, so far the main, some of the big ones of the OWASP top 10. And then OWASP.org, this is another great site. Uh, the OWASP top 10, uh, there's a lot of free tools on there like Burp, I mean like a Zap attack proxy, which is a good replacement for Burp Suite if you don't have a commercial license of Burp Suite. And there's like a page with just vulnerable, uh, different vulnerable applications on there, a page dedicated to that. So that's one, if you're gonna do anything with web application, you, have to, you definitely have to check out that for sure. And I recommend that to anyone because all pen testers need to know some level of web application pen testing. And then hack the box, hackthebox.eu. That's a good resource. I saw recently on Twitter a 16-year-old kid that just recently got his uh, OSCP, and he spent it. He said he spent a year on hack the box to get his OSCP. So that's a really good one. And the over the wire CTF, those are good. Like over the wire.org forward slash war games. Uh, I think it's the Bandit CTF series that if you're wanting to learn about. Um, Linux security or Unix security, those are really good at learning Linux and uh, Unix security. And after this, this is already posted up. So if anyone wants this page or the links to the resources, if you go to the hackermaker.com learning dash resources, this whole list is up there. So it will be available there. And certifications. These first, first uh, two I got listed, the CH and Pentest Plus, these are, your, are good entry level certifications. Uh, the CH is really widely recognized by HR and management. So these are ones that, you know, will some will 
help you get points towards, you know, HR forwarding on your resume because people are used to seeing these. The CEH is also a DOD cert. So companies that, um, that are uh, doing business with the government have government contracts. They like to see people with DOD certs like the CEH and CISSP. Uh, a lot of the CompTIA certs are on that list. I'm not sure if the Pentest Plus has made it yet, but the Pentest Plus is a new one. It's a little over, it's coming up on a year old. They released the beta stuff last year and I switched my class to the Pentest Plus to offer them a certification path. At least the first two are just, you know, really good uh, certifications to get your foot in the door. But once you get, we progress down this list, like the SANS g Pen and OSCP, these are two of the most widely uh, listed certifications on for pen test jobs. Uh, most often I see those, actually these last four, I see them a lot. And the SAN stuff is really good, but it's expensive. Uh, but then offensive security, their content is really good and really recognized. And with the, the uh, offensive security stuff, you act, actually have to go into a lab and hack into systems to get certified. So it's more of a uh, hands-on type exam opposed to uh, answering questions and scenarios and stuff. Although there's a lot of value to the SAN stuff, but kind of to give you the, where I see the value in stuff like the uh, hands-on labs is a lot of pen test jobs you go for when they give you your technical interview. Part of the technical interview is they usually give you a Cali VM to hack into a vulnerable VM or a network they have set up as vulnerable that you perform a pen test on. So although the, the knowing the answers and understanding that knowledge is important, but the hands-on aspect goes a long way towards getting a pen test job. The GXPN is SANS uh, Advanced Pen Testing and Exploit Development. That's kind of like the next level above these, the GPEN and OSCP. And then the OSCE is, a, is heavy on the exploit development. It's kind of similar to, to the, the GXPN. But these are all really good certs to get, to get your foot in the door. And even though you want to make sure you know the content, because just having the certs a lot of times won't get you the job. you got to get into the technical interview. You've got to be able to explain different vulnerabilities, methodologies, and how to hack into things. You need to understand these. So if you go through one of these things, don't make sure you stay, you know, practicing in the labs. Keep this content fresh because you get your OSCP and say like you're working the help desk and then you finally get a chance to interview for a pen test job three years later and you haven't been keeping up with this, you're probably going to have a hard time in your technical interview. So certifications are definitely the way to get your foot in the door. I know a lot of awesome pen testers that have no certs, but they're able to prove it on the interviews. But as far as what, I, what I'd advise someone as a beginner, sometimes you need that certification just to get, to get started. And job tips, professional networking community is huge. Uh, I recommend to my students every semester to join the local meetups, go to the local meetups. You wanna become a regular, you want people to know you and kind of know what kind of jobs you're looking for. I had a recruiter ask me for a list of uh, students that might be uh, interested in pen testing jobs. So along with my students, I knew of another guy that was a recent college grad that had stayed at one of the last Dallas Hackers Association meetings. And I've known him for a couple of years, so I know he's a good, responsible person, smart, and can do the job. And he had mentioned one of the meetings that he was looking for a pen testing job. So once this uh, recruiter approached me about the jobs, I passed on his information. He actually got the job. So getting into the community and knowing people, people knowing your skill set goes a long way. My last two full-time pen testing jobs have been through people I know in the security community, my local community. And I get side work from people that I know in the community. And LinkedIn, you want a good LinkedIn profile. This is not Facebook. So you want to make sure you have a professional picture, you know, kind of, you know, it's like your resume, it's your online resume. So keep it clean. Don't put controversial stuff on there. Uh, have a professional picture on there. Uh, you know, be truthful like you would your resume. New things you learn, put on there, but don't put something on it. You're not going to be able to explain in, the, in an interview. And that's my advice on your resume period. If you use some tool once, you know, you, do you really want to put that on there and go through the interview? And the more items you have on your resume that you're not able to answer how to use or describe, then that's going to kind of uh, not look too good for you in the interview. 
and prepare for your interviews. So before you go in there, especially when you're just starting out and you're really not, you don't know the OS top 10, like the back of your hand, then I would recommend going on, on you know, go through the OWASP top 10, understand the vulnerabilities and how you're able to meet those vulnerabilities. Early on in my career, one of my best interviews, I went over the OWASP top 10, like the day before, the night before my interview. And sure enough, those come up. On pen testing interviews, more, most of the vulnerabilities you're gonna hear are gonna be easily OWASP top 10. Even though the people interviewing you may not even, uh, you know, that may not be their background, but those are just some of the most well-known uh, vulnerabilities out there and be able to explain the basics like the three, three-way TP, TCP handshake in the OSI model. People are still a- ask stuff like that, especially when you get into management, you know, maybe you're not using, the, you know, referring to OS model, OSI model a lot in the job you're currently in. Some management, you know, their background, where they come from at a time where it's more important. So just kind of understand these, the know a lot of these IT basics, just brush up before you go in there. Don't, be a total surprise. Look at the job description and the things they want you to know and make sure that maybe some of these tools you've used, go through, review the tools, brush up on it before you go into the interview. And uh, let's, that's all the content that I have prepared for this, right. but uh, I'll leave this open for questions. All right, we'll see if we have questions from the chat, but thank you, Philip. Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. And anyone can feel free to reach out to me on DM and I'll be happy to answer their questions. All right, we'll see if anything comes in through the chat. That was an awesome introduction. Thanks, Phil. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. There was a lot of discussion going on during the talk. Okay, cool. Uh, especially around the certification stuff about um, you know, like some people really rip on the CEH and um, yeah. yeah, I was just, I, I was telling people, uh, you know, my, my personal view is that anything that shows that you're dedicated to the field um, gives you a leg up and the CEH I think is a cost effective one and it does get you past the like resume pile of someone who doesn't have it. If you're not going to, take an entry level cert and you're coming from nothing like you've never had a security job before you got to make sure to like put all of your ctf experience and your like pen tester labs and all the stuff you put on the slide before that make sure to fit that into your resume because i mean at the end of the day a hiring manager who knows anything about security and i've done this a lot is Mm -hmm. looking for that passion or that uh proof that at least you've put in effort to do um, to do the stuff, even though you've never had a, the practical job to do it or the actual job to do it. So um, that would be something I suggest. Yeah. And I'm with you on the CH. I don't, I'm not a fan of it myself. And I've kind of, you know, kind of battled me for, I've said some pretty negative comments before in the past about it and was approached by EC council at one time about helping with some content. And just because I don't really believe in it, I couldn't do it, but I, mean, I, I just couldn't bring myself to it. I feel like I was selling out, but like you said, it's a foot in the door and someone that's a desktop technician and they went through the time to study the CEH, that goes to show something because you know, there's a lot of people that that work in the field that don't put in the effort. And so at least it shows they're putting effort and trying to learn. Yeah, absolutely. It's your foot in the door, you know, just having those certifications. That's when it's most important. Oh, you know, yeah. Someone like yourself, you go and accompany people, see your experience. They don't care about certifications because you're going to be able to explain how to do any kind of vulnerability or the latest exploits and explain methodology and all that easily, but someone without that, they definitely need it just to even get, you know, someone to even be yeah. interested in it. I suggest the yeah. same thing to people. Like I, I personally, I didn't finish college. I dropped out. And so some people ask me about that. And, um, you know, those first few years in your career, it's all about showing that you've got the skills to pay the bills kind of thing. And once you get past, you know, you kind of win people's trust and you can point to your resume that you have past projects with success, obviously that helps. But in those first early years, that's why these things, these certifications and whatnot can be helpful. It's Um, just a way... Yeah, go ahead. It's just a way to separate yourself from everyone else. If everyone else is coming in with a bachelor's degree, none of them have certs, then you have certs. It's just kind of a way to stand out in the crowd. Exactly. 
Um, Casey had a question about um, kind of the market. He says, given that the market tends to think about network and app testing as different things, how do you think uh, that difference affect what newcomers learn? So he's, he, I think he's kind of suggesting like, how can new bug hunters kind of make the transition from app testing to network penetration testing? And how do those worlds kind of coexist with one another today in your experience? I think as far as application, understanding how to find the vulnerabilities and stuff, you can translate it. Because I think if you know one or the other, it's easier to learn the other. I really think most people getting started out are more intimidated with the application side of things. But yeah, if you're just, of course, kind of like in my deep showing uh, how to analyze your skill set and do this, the uh, gap analysis on where you need to go. So that's basically what someone would need to do. Look at the areas they're weak in. And uh, cause you know, even some people that are doing the web app, maybe they understand web servers somewhat and they understand HTTP protocols and stuff like that. Just, they just need to, I would say, step back and learn the basics like network, plus related stuff, you know, and you don't have to necessarily do that network plus, but like Professor Messer has a whole video series on A plus and network plus and security plus. So that's what they would just need to, to learn those areas. Okay. Um, seems to be the biggest, seems to be one of the biggest uh, hurdles for most people in general is understanding the networking piece of it. Casey added uh, an additional thing to his question. He said, or nope, he just deleted it. So maybe he uh, didn't want that question. <laughs> um, but um, uh, let's see, what else were people asking? They were, um, Haddix, you're welcome to chime in if you wanted. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Casey's question was trying to uh, basically separate out like the, again, like a sub question to the AppSec versus NetSec stuff. I think... Um, like my view on it is most pen tests these days, like that get sold at least, are actually application tests. Um, the, the network pen test style of port scanning and vulnerability assessment leading to exploitation, then pivoting on the internal network and then exploiting more things and then getting domain controller um, you know, access or you know, access to personal data. That, uh, that skill set is highly technical, but it, I think it's, I see it less and less these days. Um, and so a lot of pen testers who used to like do that for their full-time jobs have moved to red team um, jobs where they they now do like full scope pen testing and include social engineering and just do all kinds of adversarial simulation. And so um, really like you can start out either way. I, I actually think that um, I think that net, net pen is a little bit easier than AppSec to get started on because it's like, pretty easy to learn how to like port scan and um and then like do some vulnerability analysis and it also gets you like really spun up on scripting and um you know sometimes some exploit development or at least learning how exploits work and um so that's a that's a really good path um so probably more beneficial to start out with NetPen and move into AppSec but I think it's uh I think with me the challenge with AppSec is that there's so many different frameworks and like web servers and technologies in AppSec. So when I started learning AppSec, it was super daunting. It was just like, there is so much crap on the internet that I have no idea how it works. So um, uh, it was beneficial for me to start in NetPen and move to AppSec because uh, I had the hacker mindset and I knew, I knew kind of like that the core of all security problems are a lot of the core of all security problems are like configuration issues and input issues, right? like putting stuff where it isn't supposed to go and things being misconfigured. And so like, because I knew that from network moving to AppSec, I definitely had the right mindset and I just had to get spun up on everything else. So that would be my answer, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So I think also too, with a lot of people, you know, because you, you remember earlier on, they weren't doing reoccurring vulnerability scans internally. And so I think since more companies are starting to do more of that kind of between their pen tests, I think there's, less stuff out there the scope of the pen test is probably lighter because there's they're not finding as much stuff and and it's easily to go easy to go through yeah i mean i uh, i was just going to say um one of the things is that one of our analysts at bug crowd kevin he's uh uh you know he works for us full time now but he he was in one of my asset classes and um he had zero experience um and, and a couple of uh and he put himself through all of the pen testers lab things and pen tester lab now has free certifications that you can get if you 
complete a whole bunch of their exercises in a row um, and yeah. you can get a free certification. Um, now it doesn't like mean a bunch in the industry, but it, it is a certification and you can put it on your resume and like um, it's, you know, like I guess like resume building for AppSec or pen test or the security information could probably be its own talk and like what to focus on and how to do it. But um, there's, there's a whole bunch of paths to get into this. So, yeah. Yeah. I like the pen tester lab stuff and how now they've got it set up to where you can post it on, on your LinkedIn profile showing what badges you've completed. Yeah. And it's yeah. to show someone's actively learning too. Yep. Absolutely. So small lessons. Yeah, as far as teaching, uh, I can't really think of any. Maybe if I could add like an advanced pen testing course at the college where I'm at, I was wanting to add web app pen testing, which I was able to add this semester, which was good. It was nice to add something new because after so many semesters teaching the same thing, it's nice to have something new in there. And uh, what is most profitable if you're talking from a teaching perspective, I guess, if you taught like it's SANS or something like that, probably be most profitable if you did uh you know private teaching which for me it's kind of it's interesting because that's someone recently asked want me to do some training for their company which i would do but i've had individuals come up and ask me hey i want you to be my mentor if i pay you will you teach me and i can't take money from an individual i mean i i got into teaching to help other people i teach at a community college and that's i had the opportunity to teach at a, a private school and make more but i like to be able to teach people i want people to be able to afford it if my dream is if I had, say like if I if a dream come true for me is if I won the lottery or someone gave me millions of dollars, here, do this, I would start up a free school. You know, I'd offer a free school and it wouldn't, it would be focused on security and pen testing. And it would start out with some of the more uh, elementary things to get people up to speed where they need to be to be a good pen tester. But if I just had something, this big chunk of money, I would start a free school because teaching people, that's one of the reasons I started Pwn School was because some people were having difficulties getting into my class. And, you know, I wanted something affordable for anyone. So all they have to do is show up and learn. So if I could do whatever I wanted to, that's what I do. And, and just teaching, helping people is rewarding. You know, it's not about the money because I could make more money teaching somewhere else, but I continue to teach at a community college. I like that it's affordable. Most people can afford it themselves or they can get student loans or their companies will pay for it. So I like the affordability. And you know, that's kind of one of the things I like about uh, bug bounties and like bug crowd, they're offering opportunities to people that otherwise wouldn't have it. Have it. And that's kind of why I think I've kind of fit in with your culture because I really believe in helping others. And it's just not about, not about the money when it comes to that. Well, that's a good note to leave on. Um, thank you so much, Philip. Really appreciate the love and uh, the sharing of knowledge. Um, and yeah, feel free to th throw up your information there. How can they find you? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. And then also my ha my website, thehackermaker.com. So as we mentioned earlier, I've got a link up for the re learning resources. Uh, so it's just learning dash resources. So if they want to get those links. So feel free to send me DMs. I'm constantly communicating people with people on LinkedIn or or Twitter that are wanting to get into pen testing or just security in general. Awesome. Well, everyone in the chat, please give them a round of, the, of applause on, uh, on the YouTube chat. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, you. You, you can find Phil. Um, he hangs out on our discord as well. Um, so you can join the bit.ly slash hacker discord. And uh, we've got several of our other folks in there as well. So thank you so much, Philip. Really appreciate your time. Great talk. And um, we'll get set up for our next one. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.